hustle culture, workaholic. <laughs> work harder, work smarter, work more. Climbing the ladder. I just think of the Dolly song, working nine to five. You know, they don't call it a rat race for nothing, right? I think there's a, just an inherent struggle around what the definition of work is and why we actually have to do it and who we're actually working for. I think sometimes work is just work. <laughs> You have to work to make money, to support your family, but you have to find purpose in what you do. So whether you're in school, whether you're playing a sport. Whether you're a stay-at-home mom. Whether I'm working at, you know, Gulfstream. Or on a construction site. You know, our world, it's filled with these external forces. It creates a pressure cooker saying you need to do more, you need to be more, you need to make more. Moving and losing that job kind of had that little bit of a, well, what do I have to offer now? You do hear oftentimes is to find your purpose, but I think when it comes to work, people don't necessarily know how to mesh those two things together. God has put you wherever it is to do your job, to do your work, because there's something that he wants you to see, some way that he wants you to be a part of his kingdom. Well, you do it where you are, you do it where your feet are placed. I love the way that our friends were able to capture some of the nuances and complexity of, of work. That, that there are different angles and different considerations, of course. The one thing that I want to emphasize from that video is that over the course of this series, when I'm communicating or someone else is communicating in the series and we use the word work, uh, we don't want you to only lock in on the idea of job or career, the thing you get a paycheck for. This series will apply equally to those who are students, uh, full-time moms and dads, retirees, because basically by work, we're essentially talking about whatever it is that you're giving so much of your time and energy to. I also want to start by just going, how about we sit with a quote together to just kick off our thinking at the start of this series? I want to quote read you, show you a quote from the pastor John Mark Comer. Uh, in regards to work, he said, in the church, we often spend the majority of our time teaching people how to live the minority of their lives. Just sit with the tension of that for a moment. John Mark is not talking about the fact that the things the church so frequently talks about are unimportant. In fact, he, as a pastor, is probably most famous talking about spiritual disciplines, prayer and reading scripture and fasting and things like that. He's not saying that those things are unimportant and neither am I. This is a question of time, literally just a question of time. Because you can imagine, imagine with me somebody who takes seriously some of the foundational things the church does talk about, like sharing your faith, evangelism. Jesus commands it, very important. Imagine someone who has a job but is like fully committed to evangelism. That person is gonna talk about the things of faith with every single one of their coworkers, but they are still gonna spend far more time answering emails or going to meetings or checking inventory or stocking shelves or grading papers or preparing meals or studying for tests or writing code or whatever, right? It's a question of time. The, the majority of our waking lives will be spent working. If you're an average lifespan and then have like an average kind of job, you're going to spend 10.5 years working. That's 92,000 hours. This big section down here, that's sleeping. It don't count. This portion <laughs> up here, the next largest section of how we're spending our time is work. Ten and a half years. So we're going to spend the majority of our waking hours working, and the majority of us do not like what we do. Gallup has been doing this poll for a long time. This is just the most recent one, where they found that 70% of Americans are either not engaged or actively disengaged with their work. What does that look like? Well, that looks like minimum effort. That looks like uh, you know, people who are either consistently distracted or, if you're actively disengaged, actively trying to distract yourself from what you're doing. It means that people are spending their time at work basically just trying to endure it, counting down to their next break, to when they get to clock out, to the next weekend, to the next vacation, to the next summer break, to whatever. It looks like treating your job purely as a means to an end 
And what end are we talking about? This end. <laughs> Leisure. <laughs> Getting done with work to do whatever it is you'd rather be doing than work. And the American dream, it feels like, at one point, it was this high-minded idea of opportunity. It honestly feels like it's devolved into the new American dream is to make as much money as possible, putting in as little time and energy as possible so that you can get done working and go do whatever this is that represents in your own life. And so what ends up happening is, is we have a bunch of people, the majority of Americans by this polling, who essentially look at their jobs as something to be endured. They're just watching the clock, ticking down the seconds and minutes and hours until they can stop working, go do what they actually want to do, even though that work is going to fill the majority of their waking hours for the rest of their life. What a miserable way to live. If I could summarize it, the majority of us are spending the majority of our time feeling like the majority of our time is wasted. That's a depressing sentence, isn't it? Then let me throw some encouragement your way instead. The Bible starts talking about work as soon as it talks about anything. Work is one of the first topics the Bible actually addresses. And according to Scripture, this kind of work, and I emphasize this kind of work because it's not just like my kind of work where you might look at it and go, well, yeah, like a pastor, that's like the right kind of work. No, the Bible talking about simple, straightforward work talks about this kind of work having dignity. That this kind of work is not something to be seen as a burden or just something to be endured. In fact, the Bible talks about work as something that is intrinsic to what it means to be human. It's part of what we were designed to do. That's two very different views of work, isn't it? That's what this series is about. This series is ultimately going to be about that kind of question. What is, how should we view work, and how do we get to the place of viewing work the way we ought to? And in this particular, I'm just going to set the expectations. This is a big topic, which means that today, uh, I'm not going to be able to resolve all of these tensions. I'm not going to be able to answer all the questions. I'm not going to be able to solve all the problems, uh, and I'm not going to try to. That's the purpose of the entire series that we're going to do on this topic. Today, if anything, I'm going to try to up the tension instead of resolve it. Because each of us, each of us have a view of work and it's leaning towards one or the other. And wherever you're at, depending on your view, could really be affecting the level of misery or just that sense of just having to endure it that you're experiencing. On the flip side, I genuinely believe that if you engage on this, if you lean into this tension, if you have conversations with your friends, the people that are beside you, your coworkers, if you have conversations with God about this, that you may be able to find, by trusting the scriptures, you can find a greater purpose and meaning and joy in an area of your life where you might feel like it is sorely lacking. So let's up that tension a little bit. Why is it that so uni- work is so universally challenging and frankly disliked? Because if you actually think about it, it, it kind of is strange that something that has so many differences between individuals, yet we can all kind of agree that we don't like it, <laughs> even though we're doing such different things. Uh, we have different jobs. We have, that means that we, those of us who are working, that means that we have different bosses, uh, some of us don't have bosses at all. You're, you're an entrepreneur, or you're self-employed, you're working at home, you're a student. Uh, and, y- and yet there's that universal feeling of disliking work. Uh, we have different tasks, we have different coworkers, we have different hours, we have different home situations which are driving this need to like provide. I mean, there's all sorts of differences. And yet we're united on not liking it. <laughs> Why is that? Well, it's because there is some like core thinking that really does affect all of this. And one of the core things that affects our view of work is the fact that our modern world puts great high value on freedom. Freedom. And for most people, what freedom looks like is essentially being able to do 
whatever it is you want to do, whenever you want to do it, having no constraints, no limitations. So the modern view of freedom tends to be, most people mean by freedom, they mean freedom from constraint. And in that picture, this guy is more free than that guy. Because that guy has a nine to five, he's got a boss, he's going to be evaluated, he's got to check in and check out and do certain things in a certain time frame. It seems like he has way more constraints than this guy. And if freedom is such a good thing, and freedom means having no constraints, this is the more free person. But all that depends on if that is actually the right definition of freedom. Maybe it's not the right definition. So think of this. Uh, Just imagine this with me. Imagine a fish. This is a beautiful fish. A (laughs) lovely creation of the Lord. This is a blobfish. And um, uh, fish are designed differently from you and I. Uh, They need oxygen just like we do, but they are designed to absorb that oxygen from water instead of air. Okay. Now imagine if you wanted to give this fish freedom and you decided to remove it from the constraints of water, and you put it up on the beach, would this fish actually be more free? No. Its movement, its thriving, eventually its life would all ultimately end because freedom is not necessarily about having no constraints. It's about embracing the right constraints that honor the nature of who we are and what we were meant to be. Okay, so, so let's apply this to, to me, to you. You know what I'd love? I'd love to be freed from the constraint that I have regarding food. I wish that I could eat whatever I wanted to eat as often as I wanted to eat it, as much of it as I wanted to eat. And all of God's people would say, amen. amen. I know, right? Hey, we've, we've found unity in the church. Okay, <clears throat> here's the problem. If I did that, in fact, since y'all all amen so robustly, if we did that, the problem is we'd end up looking like, well, this fish. Uh, that's what we would look like. We would start to degrade physically to the point where our freedom would not be increased, our freedom would be decreased. We would start to deteriorate because we're not honoring the nature that we've been given, which requires balance and things like nutrition and exercise and et cetera. Freedom is not about having no constraint. Freedom is actually about embracing the right constraints, which lead to us being able to thrive and to flourish because we have to remember and honor the nature that we've had from the moment we've been created. So if that's, if this is true, then we have to reconsider which of these two folks are actually more free. Because, and this is not going to surprise any of you, obviously I'm heading in a certain direction, I would argue this guy's actually more free than that guy. Because this actually honors the nature of our reality and how we were created in a way that this guy doesn't. Now, if that's true, And look, I'm about to go like, hey, let's look at where the scripture teaches this is true. Again, spoiler alert, that's obviously where I'm going. But before we get there, I know not everybody in here believes that the Bible is the, is the inspired word of God. And so if I immediately jump, hey, I'll just show you to where this says this in the Bible, that's not going to be convincing to you, and nor should it be if you have not yet decided what you believe about God's word or Jesus. So if this is true, though, the thing that should make you lean in is if there are signs to this being true in like reality, in things that data and things like that, and actually there are signs that this is true in the research and the data. One of the things that shows that actually this guy is more free than that guy is that it's been found that the unemployed are 30% less happy than the employed, which is wild considering how much most of us hate our jobs. (laughs) If the jobs aren't contributing to our happiness, if anything, they're making us less happy, the fact that there's even a greater drop for the unemployed is kind of wild. Now, I know what you think about that data because it's the same thing I thought. You're going, duh, Marcus, it's because you need money to live. And if you don't have a job, you don't have money, they're going to be miserable because they're they're poor and they're struggling to survive. Well, that's what I thought too. And that's why the people that are doing this kind of research, kind of genius, 
they decided to do research on the people who don't need money but don't work. People that like uh, and got this giant inheritance or won the lottery or won a court case or sold a business or something where they suddenly had a ton of money come in, money was no longer an issue, and so they said, well, then I'm quitting my job so I can be this guy. And so they have all the money they need and no job, and the research has shown that just like any other unemployed person, they also dropped massively in happiness because it's not about the money, or at least the money's not the main factor. Work is. Having purpose and and meaning connected in some way to our work. This is exactly what the Bible teaches. And like I said, the Bible talks about it as early as it talks about anything. And so we can, when I say that, I wasn't exaggerating. We can go to literally the first line of the Bible. Genesis 1, verse 1 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. He created light and sky, land and sea. And then he started to form and create the things that would fill those spaces. He created the sun and the moon and the stars. He placed them in the heavens. He created birds to fill the skies and fish to fill the seas and plants and animals to fill the land. And then he formed man. But man wasn't just placed on land like everybody else. God also, for man, created a special place called the Garden of Eden. And in chapter 2, verse 8 It says, the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east. And I just want you to hold on to that idea, that word, he planted the garden. As this continues, uh, the Bible summarizes all these acts of creation at the end of verse, uh, excuse me, chapter one, in the beginning of chapter two, and it says, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. I'll just circle this, the he rested idea. Uh, I am so pumped to talk about Sabbath with y'all. Uh, it's like the dessert at the end of the meal. We're saving it towards the end of the series, but I'm excited about it. I think it might be some of the best stuff we talk about. Just to clear this up for anybody that's confused, He's not resting because he's tired and he's worn out. The picture here is that he's delighting in his work. Like, like if you, like if you like love barbecue and you've invested time, you've smoked something, and then you get that first bite and you just like, yes, I'm so glad I did this. You're out on the front porch, you're drinking something nice and cool as you look out at the yard work you've done and you're admiring the nice clean lines you've gotten in your yard. This This is the picture. He's delighting in his work. But we also take a step back from that and just say, we're going to talk about that later. The actual words I want to focus on are are these. Work, work. Over and over and over again, it says that God worked. Now, you might have noticed that one of the things I really like to do is point out, like, words and original languages and context and do a version of going like, man, it just seems like a really simple word in English. There's actually, it's way more interesting than that. And I get super nerdy about it. Well, this one is like the, it's the the exact opposite. The thing that's interesting about it is it's not special at all. It's not, there's nothing special about this word at all. It's not like super work, special work, divine work, God work. It's nothing, it's nothing like that. It's just work. And it's the word that's used to describe what God's doing in chapters 1 and 2. And then for the rest of the Bible, it's what's used to describe just what people do in their day-to-day lives. There's nothing special about that word. Which means that this picture of creation is a picture of God as a master craftsman. He had this idea, this plan, and then he, he carried it out. He formed and worked it himself. He He's like an engineer or designer or an artist. And he's a, he's a gardener. He's a worker. And I can't overemphasize how unique this picture of God is in all of the great faiths and, and, uh, and belief systems of this world. And not just like still today, modern times, which is true, but especially if you look at the thinking about God or gods 
at the time that this was recorded, the time that this was being taught to young Jewish children about how things came to be. And I'll, I'll just point out one thing to, as, a, as a point of like the contrast. And I'll point to actually uh, people that are even in, in a similar context to the Israelites. Uh, their neighbors, the Babylonians. And the reason I choose the Babylonians is in part because uh, if you remember your history classes, your social studies classes back in the day, the Babylonian, the Babylonian Empire, Babylon was like a center of culture in that time. And so what the Babylonians believed reflected what a lot of people in that time and in that area believed. Another good reason to choose the Babylonians is because we have their full creation account. It's called the Enuma Elish, and we have it in its entirety. And after in this creation account of the Babylonians, the world is made, there's a scene soon after where the Babylonian pantheon, the little G gods of Babylon, all come to their king. His name was Marduk. And they have a complaint. They're bringing an official complaint to their king. And their complaint is, ugh, all this work is miserable. Marduk, we have to, we have to plant our own crops. We, we have to make our own meals. We have to do our laundry and sweep our floors, and we have to make our beds. Ugh, Marduk, this is beneath us. This work is so constraining. It limits us in so, so many ways, Marduk. Marduk, we were built for freedom. We were built for fun. We were built to look like, like this. And all this work is so limiting to us, it's beneath us. It's beneath our dignity. We need to find a solution for this. And Marduk actually completely agrees. He also was wishing he was sipping daiquiris on a beach somewhere. And so he's like, yeah, I'm on board. And he comes up with this genius idea. You know what? How about we make something that can do all of this work for us? Do you want to guess what Marduk created to do all the work for the gods? Us. Us. We have it. This is a direct quote from their creation story. Marduk says, I will create a savage. Man shall be his name. He shall be charged with the service of the gods that they might be at ease. What is the Babylonian concept of the purpose of humanity? Slave labor. That humans were created as lower creatures to do low work, things that were beneath the dignity of the gods, so that there could be no constraint on the gods. Instead, the constraint would all be placed on, on the people. This idea was essentially that work was a burden, it was a curse, and it was put on these low creatures so that the gods didn't have to get dirt under their pretty fingernails so that they could kick up their feet and be at ease. And instead, the idea was that as humans would farm and they would uh, you know, uh, sow seeds and, and reap in crops and they'd make things and they would come and present all these things to the temples. They'd even build the temples because that's how essentially they clothed and fed and housed the gods so they wouldn't have to do it for themselves. That was the whole concept of what was happening. This is essentially the whole worldview of, of ancient religions. This is very common. This is essentially how the Egyptians saw it, the Greeks saw it, the Norse saw it. But God is nothing like Marduk and his buddies. First reason is, he's big G God. <laughs> he is the one and the only God. He, he is not, there's nothing like him. He is eternal, self-sustaining, all-powerful, which means he doesn't need to do any of this stuff. So why does he choose to work? Because he wants to. It's voluntary. He seems to enjoy it. And why create humanity? Well, it's certainly not to fill needs or do low-dignity things that he doesn't want to do. He chose to do it on his own. No, humanity is created because he wants to share his own presence with them and to call them into joining him in the work that he's doing in this world. And so, if we're just, just all this is laid out in, in what God says about his creation of humanity. What did Marduk say? Marduk said, let us create savages so I can be at ease. What does God say? God says, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. So then God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. The next verse says, and God blessed them. 
Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every other living thing that moves on the earth. I, I just want to point out this right here at the top. The, the first thing, see, blessed. That's the first thing he did. He blessed. We'll come back and emphasize that. But before that, let's just go into this, uh, this actually this image of God thing. I'll even uh, bounce back a couple times. Um, the image of God is a, the, the imago Dei is what it is, is, another word that maybe you've heard before. It means image of God. This is a deep, rich, complex, beautiful theology, doctrine, belief system that impacts so many different areas of life in our world. And it could be a whole series of its own, and one day maybe it will be. But I'll keep it simple right off the top and just let you know that that word image, image of God, it could be just simply translated as like a statue. And it's, it's that's fundamentally, that is the concept. That in the same way a statue represents something to, to other people, that humanity is meant to image God, to represent God to his creation. And also in a similar way, it's like we stand in his place where, where we are, representing him to creation and, and stewarding his creation the way he would have it led. This is why he ultimately gives us dominion over the world. This is what it means to stand in his place. This is the dignity that God has created us with. And ultimately, what it looks like is that blessing first, that serving even, of saying, I, I'm going to create for you a garden, a place for you to live, and then he gives an assignment. And one of those descriptions is this. It says he put humanity, us, in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. He planted it and kept it first. Now we're joining into that work. Now the emphasis I want to put on this, because this is how it's going to drive this all home and make this all hopefully connect and help us. So I want to emphasize what God did first. The first thing he did was bless us and serve us. God led with grace, as he always has and always will, a free gift to us without any expectation in response. He makes the world, he creates us in his image, he creates a perfect and unique home for us to share his presence with us, then he gives us an assignment. Which means, to, in summary, blessing first, work second. And the reason that's important is, contrast that to the Babylonian concept. What did they believe? That work was a burden, it was a curse. The whole concept was, humanity is created with a task and the task is to do our stuff for us. And if, if you do a good job of doing the low dignity stuff that has been placed upon you, if you do that, then the gods may bless you. You're earning it from them. But our God is not like Marduk and his buddies. Our God leads with, as he always has and always will, he leads with grace. Which means... We don't work to earn God's blessing. God extends his blessing and his grace. Then he extends an invitation to join him in his work. That, that is the testimony of scripture. Now, I want to try to drive this home. And the way I want to drive this home is show an example of how this played out in the lives of young men who this was like life and death. Because this, this kind of thing is described for us in a story in scripture. At one point in Israel's history, they're conquered by their neighbors, Babylon. And what Babylon did at the time is they would abduct these youth of great potential and take them back to Babylon to re-educate them. Uh, a story that focuses on that is the book of Daniel. It focuses on four young men who are in that situation. In Daniel 1, verse 4, this whole idea, this re-education idea, is described as that they were to be taught the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. The Chaldeans just being another word for Babylonians. What kind of literature were they being taught? Well, the Enuma Elish, 
the Babylonian creation story, which would have taught them that they were of low dignity and therefore given work as a burden, as a curse, as a punishment, and if they work, then maybe they will be blessed. This is the kind of belief system they'd be taught. This is reflected in the fact that their names are changed. The chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel, he called Belteshazzar, and Hananiah, he called Shadrach, and Mishael, he called Meshach, and Azariah, he called Abednego. I know that's just all alphabet soup. That means like nothing to none of us. But the names at the time, especially in this culture, carried great weight and meaning. And this is what those names meant. Daniel meant God is my judge, but Belteshazzar means may Bel protect his life. Hananiah says Yahweh is gracious. Shadrach says under the command of one of their gods, Aku. Mishael means who is like our God, but Meshach means guest of a king. Azariah means God has helped us, but Abednego literally means slave of Nebo one of their gods. These these names originally were these names declaring the greatness and the uniqueness and the transcendence and goodness of God. But their names were changed and literally half of them just called them slaves. So please don't confuse this as just some kind of like interesting comparative religion facts that, you know, one day you'll be able to really impress your buddies at A trivia night? (laughs) No, no, no. This kind of thinking, the perspectives on work is very, very old. It's been all around for a long time. And what all of this is pointing to is that these two views of work as either being it's a burden that has to be endured so we can get to the stuff that's actually important or it's something that carries its own dignity. These two views... These two views don't start with how you view work. They start with how you view God. And therefore, how you view your own dignity and purpose. So, where are you? All of us are somewhere between these two in our own thinking about the work that we have or the work that we're taking classes for and training for, the work we wish we had, we're all somewhere between these two. Where are you right now? And more importantly, where would you like to be tomorrow morning and every Monday after? Because... If you want your view of work to change, it doesn't start with how you view work. It starts with how you view God. What difference does this make if you're a teacher, a soldier, a nurse? If you're a full-time mom or a student, you're a software engineer or many of the other hundreds of things I could try to come up with at the top of my head right now. It can make every difference, every difference, if you begin with belief in a God who worked, and then he blessed, and then he invited. Because that God, the first time we see him in the Bible, he's a gardener, and in the New Testament, he's a carpenter which means you are made in the image of a working God. And what that means is that there is nothing, not a single thing in your work that is so, or that's too small to be filled with the dignity that God has given it and to be used by him to do far more than you could ask or imagine. It means that anything you do with, for him, can be of extraordinary worth, impact, and power. But all of that, all of that, it does not begin with how you look at your job, how you look at whatever tasks fill your time at work. It begins with how you view your creator. Whether or not you trust that he always begins with grace, which means that the work that you have in your life 
can be connected to dignity he wants to give you, purpose and meaning that he wants to give you, impact that he wants to use you for, wherever you are and whatever you're doing, if you start with how you view him and how in turn he views you, made in his image and invited into his work. That viewpoint can change everything about how you view and interact with the things you spend the most of your time doing. And it begins with how you view him. So I'm going to pray for us and ask that God would give all of us clear eyes to see him for who he is so in turn we can start to see other things as clearly as we should. Please join me in prayer. Father, we recognize that you are a working God found joy in your work. We also recognize that your work is good. <laughs> and that you look at us and that's, that's what you saw. And that's what you said when you made us in your image, representing you to creation around us. That because of who you are and because of your goodness, because of your grace, because of your love, because of your purposes, Every single thing that, that, that we, we look at in our, our jobs and our works, the things that we feel like are restraining and restricting and we might feel like they're worthless. And, but God, in your hands, you can use all things for the good if we're doing it with and for you. But that doesn't begin with how we try to really focus down on how important our meetings are. It begins with a focus upon you who you are at your core, what you desire for us at your heart. And so God, give us a clear eye to see you. Give us eyes to see, give us ears to hear from you and challenge us to start with how we view you and let that affect how we view everything else. We love you, Father, and we pray all that in Jesus' name. Amen.